Now let's look at kidney. Uh, some people find the kidney can be quite confusing when they first look at the slide, but in fact the correct way to approach the kidney is to first know what the histology that you want to see is, and secondly then to go seeking among uh, all of the big mess that the kidney looks like to find examples of the specific structures you want to see, which are very good and very representative examples. It's not very fruitful to dive straight into the middle of the kidney and attempt to identify all of the structures that can be seen there, because the appearance of the various tubes that make up the bulk of the kidney of course changes and is variable depending on the particularly on the plane of the section that the uh, particular specimen has been made in. So for our purposes we're going to look at uh, two parts of the kidney here the cortex which is this outer region out here and the medulla which is this uh, region here. This probably constitutes just along here one medullary pyramid and the boundary between the cortex and the medulla is along this curved aspect which we see here. In fact there's some large blood vessels that uh, you know from the notes will uh, divide and serve both the cortex and the, uh, the medulla. Out here is the cortex and even at this low magnification we can see these small dark dots here and these are actually going to be the glomeruli as we'll see and there are also some open spaces here and these are probably spaces in which the glomerulus is out of the plane of section or in fact as can happen the glomerulus fell out during the course of uh, sectioning the tissue. So now let's move to the cortex uh, out in this region out here and let's take a look at higher magnification at what we can see. Here we are looking at the cortex. The outer part of the cortex of the kidney uh, should have a reasonably dense connective tissue uh, capsule on it. We can see a little bit of the capsule perhaps just along here. The bulk of the cortex is made up of profiles of tubes, either proximal or distal convoluted tubules, and indeed some collecting ducts and loops of Henle. And uh, these tubes form the bulk of the material we can see here. Embedded within that material are these structures, which are the very large glomeruli, the filtration structures of the uh, kidney, uh, which we can see, and we'll look at these in more detail in a moment. In the cortex, there are regions in which we can see stripes or striations or ray-like structures. These are they here, and these are tubes cut in longitudinal uh, section, and these uh, are, give rise to the appearance known as medullary rays. Uh, in this instance, uh, medullary ray means a uh, ray or a collection of uh, tubes oriented longitudinally which are extending into the medulla and it's not actually part of the medulla that's found in the uh, in the cortex. So now let's take a look at, uh, go to higher magnification perhaps and take a look at some of these glomeruli and see if we can make out any interesting features of the glomeruli themselves. So here we've zoomed in in the cortex into a region where we can see a uh, glomerulus uh, here. Now much of this glomerulus is out of focus and this is because the uh, this section is quite thick and it's very difficult to get a single plane of focus in which everything is visible. But broadly the glomerulus is this structure here and although we can't make out the individual capillaries that make up the glomerulus we can certainly see as you can see here the red blood cells are erythrocytes that occupy those capillaries. The nuclei which we see uh, associated with these capillaries we see them along here, form the visceral layer of Bowman's capsule and these nuclei belong to either podocytes or mesangial cells and in the light microscope it's not really possible for us to be able to make out the difference between those two. The space that surrounds the glomerular capillaries and the visceral layer is the uh, urinary space into which urinary filtrate is secreted and the lining of this uh, Bowman's capsule is the parietal layer of Bowman's capsule and it's made of a simple uh, squamous uh, epithelium and we can see the nuclei of some of these uh, simple uh, squamous cells uh, just here. Surrounding the glomerulus we see a lot of different uh, types of tubes. There's one here, cut in cross section. Uh, there's one here, one here, there's one here, cut in cross section. One here in oblique section. Uh, one here, broadly in cross section. Uh, one here, broadly in cross section. One here in sort of oblique uh, section. And uh, these tubes are either proximal convoluted tubules or distal convoluted tubules. Or sometimes they may be parts of uh, loops of Henle. Really it's very difficult to identify all the various uh, tubes from one another unless they present a particularly um, a neat appearance to us. So if we look for example at the tube which is represented by where I'm moving the uh, pointer here just now, we can see the lumen appears to be collapsed 
and the uh, cells have very indistinct borders between the cells. We can make out the nuclei. This is a simple cuboidal epithelium. This is proximal convoluted tubule. Uh, here's another example of it here. We can see it around here. In fact, you can see a very thin red line. This is the basement membrane. Here are the proximal convoluted tubule cells. Here's the lumen, which doesn't look nice and clear. And this is because the apex of these cells has very long, very disorganized microvilli on them, which increase the surface area available for absorption, which is what the principal function of the uh, proximal convoluted tubule is. And as a consequence of these long microvilli, the lumen is uh, essentially obscured. So here's one proximal convoluted tubule. Here's another part. Here's another part here, an oblique section. Here's another part uh, here. Conversely, the distal convoluted tubule <coughs> is also simple columnar cells. The lumen of the tubules tends to be a little narrower. And importantly, the cells don't have apical microvilli. And therefore, the um, lumen of the tube appears uh, paler staining, as we can see here. And the cells themselves are actually um, paler staining, as we can see. So this is a distal convoluted tubule. Here we see distal uh, convoluted tubule. We see some very nice basement membrane, this red structure which we see here with distal convoluted tubule cells. Here we've got a distal convoluted tubule that's been cut in oblique section, turns off and goes off this direction. So we have proximal convoluted tubule distal convoluted tubule. And then we have structures uh, such as this one here, which could be um, and are likely to be uh, a section of the uh, loop of Henle, part of either the thick ascending or descending limb of the loop of Henle. Finally, just because we happen to have a good example in this region here, let's take a look at the juxtaglomerular apparatus and the macula densa. As you know from your notes, the macula densa is a modified part of the distal convoluted tubule where it passes by the um, vascular or arteriolar pole of the glomerulus. And it and some modified cells in the wall of the afferent arteriole collectively form a structure which is involved in the secretion of renin, which is an enzyme that regulates the activity of a hormone that controls blood pressure, and also probably in the secretion of erythropoietin, a uh, hormone which stimulates the production of additional uh, red blood cells. Here's the distal convoluted tubule with the obvious looking lumen as it passes by the vascular pole of the uh, glomerulus. And if we were to count the number of cells on this side of the tubule here by counting nuclei, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then do the same for this half of the tube, we'd find one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, it should be clear to you that here we see some cells in the distal convoluted tubule which are a bit smaller and more closely packed together. So we have a larger number of nuclei per unit area. And these are the cells that form the macula densa of the distal convoluted tubule. Here is where the afferent arteriole is. And these nuclei which we see here are the juxtaglomerular cells, the modified smooth muscle cells in the wall of the uh, afferent arteriole. And so the entirety of the structure which we see here, macula densa, JG cells, some of these associated cells here, these form the juxtaglomerular apparatus. Once again, we're at lower magnification. Here again is the cortex. Here are the glomeruli and the cortex. Along here is the boundary between the cortex and the medulla. And remember from the notes that the most important nephrons in setting up the interstitial sodium gradient are those found at the boundary between the cortex and the medulla, the juxtamedullary uh, nephrons. We can see here the tubes extending in toward the medulla, and these form the medullary rays, which are present in the um, in the cortex. Now we're going to look in the medulla. We won't look in the upper part of the medulla. We'll simply move straight out to close to the tip of the medulla out here. And we'll take a look and see what can be seen here. Largely what we're going to see are tubes which have been cut in cross section. So here we are uh, out toward the tip of the medulla, near the tip of the uh, medullary pyramid. And what we're looking at are cross-sectional profiles of a variety of different types of uh, tubes, mainly cross-sectional profiles, not entirely. So the first and the most obvious type of tube are these ones which we can see here. These are lined by a uh, tall cuboidal to columnar uh, epithelium. And these are the collecting ducts. And it's the epithelium of the collecting ducts whose permeability to water can be controlled. And it's this control of permeability to water that determines whether or not the urine which is excreted is isotonic, hypotonic, or hypertonic. Interspersed among the collecting ducts are these structures here, which are lined by a simple squamous uh, epithelium. Uh, 
Uh, these have been, we'll increase in magnification perhaps a little just to get a better view of these. These have actually uh, shrunken during the course of the uh, tissue preparation, so they've pulled back from the little bit of uh, basement membrane which would have surrounded them. Here's one here, here's one here, here's one here, here's one here, and these are the thin limbs of the loops of Henle. And the loops of Henle, as you know from your notes, the function of the loops of Henle is to create and maintain the interstitial sodium gradient which is exploited by the collecting ducts to uh, uh, retain water or lose water as is uh, necessary depending on the presence or absence of antidiuretic hormone. And finally, although it's not easy to see the uh, individual uh, vessels, particularly the vaso recta, the straight blood vessels which parallel the loops of uh, Henle, uh, what we can see rather than seeing the tubular structures themselves is we can see the uh, red congealed mass here of red blood cells, erythrocytes, and these represent erythrocytes which are contained within the capillaries of the capillary network, either that which surrounds the uh, individual collecting ducts or in this region in here for example and around here which is surrounding the uh, loops of Henle and therefore are part of the uh, vasorecta.